Hello, I'm Antonella Rivera, the principal investigator for the Coral Reef Alliance in the Mesoamerican Reef region. Today, I want to talk to you about a Caribbean reef fishery transitioning to co-management. So what do you picture when you think about the Caribbean Sea? I'm guessing for most of you, it's just a vacation spot. But for the lucky few that live there, it's their source of livelihood and food security for their families. It's estimated that around 2 million people rely on small scale Caribbean fisheries for their source of income. This number is likely so high because most of the fleet is a small scale. Now, what's also very interesting about Caribbean fisheries is how diverse they are. The Caribbean in general is a mixture of cultures and traditions which blend together into this diverse yet complex canvas and fisheries aren't the exception. So how are these fisheries doing? Well, ironically, despite them being so diverse, their management isn't. They're managed through a top-down government centralized approach in general. Also, they are suffering from weak institutions and lack of financial support, which leads to low enforcement and reduced monitoring efforts. If you pull all this together, it's not surprising that most fisheries are overexploited. Now, not all is negative. In general and worldwide, there's this shift happening from top-down government centralized management towards more community-based bottom-up efforts. And as part of this shift, co-management, which is the sharing of rights and responsibilities between the government and local stakeholders, has been promoted as a means to achieve sustainable fisheries. This is likely due to the fact that it's able to integrate a lot of diverse sectors into the management, it generates their empowerment, improves their compliance, and what's most important for Caribbean fisheries is that it's able to adapt to the needs of diverse stakeholders and to changing conditions. So co-management has been previously implemented in the Caribbean, but it's not always successful. Usually it's because communities aren't ready for the responsibility that this entails. And this brings me to our case study, which is the Tela Bay. So the Tela Bay is located in Honduras in the north coast. It's part of the Mesoamerican Reef region. It's comprised by three different protected areas. It's the blue lines that you see in the map below. But what's most interesting about the Tela Bay is that its live coral cover is on average 45% and it can be up to 61%. Just so you can have a comparison, the average for the Mesoamerican Reef region is 19. So it really is an impressive place. When researchers first discovered this place in 2011, they were impressed by all the live coral cover they saw. But there was one issue. There were no fish. Obviously, the communities were already aware of this issue and they were starting to try to do something about it. They approached decision makers and they said, We've got this problem, fish biomass is low, we depend on it for a living, let's work on a solution together. And that's how the first fishery co-management in the country was developed. By being the first of its kind, it provides this unique opportunity to understand what challenges they faced and how they overcame them. So to study this, what we did was first carry out open-ended interviews with all the stakeholders in the area, or the main stakeholders. Once we had this information on how the process came about, we started developing focus groups with the communities to understand the challenges and opportunities faced. With this information, we developed structured questionnaires that help us quantify some socioeconomic aspects as well as fishers' perception. We put all this information together and validated through group discussions. What did we find? Well, there were two main challenges faced by Tela Bay but they were able to overcome them through four important opportunities, which I'm going to tell you right now. So the main challenge, or the one that came up the most, is that there are no formal legal co-management agreements in the country, and there's no way to establishment. There's no legal precedent. Not entirely, let me tell you more about this. So De La Bay had to be creative, and the fishers there started relying on informal agreements. If you look at the picture above, you see many fisheries leaders working together hand in hand with the fisheries and agriculture authorities. Um, as I was saying, there is some light in this situation. In 2017, a new fisheries and aquaculture law was published in Honduras, and this creates the legal figure of fisheries co-management. 
There's just one small problem. The bylaws are still pending, so there's no methodology or protocols to actually legitimize the agreements that already exist. Hopefully, this will be soon resolved. The other challenge we found wasn't as surprising. As other fisheries in the Caribbean, the fisheries in Tela Bay, despite it being such a small geographic area, were very diverse, not only in their demography, but also in their harvesting strategies. What I mean by this is that where they fish, what they fish, and even how they fish varies widely among fishers. If you look at the diagram below, you can see at least seven different types of fishing gears they employ, and they tend to mix and match. Another difference we saw was their reliance on fishing. Some communities depend completely on fishing as their source of income, whereas others view it as a part-time job and tend to diversify with work on land. You're probably thinking that diversity is a good thing, and you would be right, but it can have some downfalls particularly that it generates individualistic behaviors, which lead to deterred group cohesion and can cause the exclusion of certain groups. Let me give you the example of the Tela Bay. So in Tela Bay, women play a crucial role in pre and post harvest activities. However, since they are this unique sector, they usually the work they do is viewed as housework or not real fisheries work. And what this generates is that when the decision-making process comes along, their voices aren't as heard as their male counterparts. So we're seeing how this differences in gender and communities and just way of life tend to deter group cohesion. But talking about the decision-making process, let me tell you some of the good stuff too. So there aren't any formal legal fisheries co-management agreements, but there are quite a few pre-existing collaborative arrangements. For instance, the three protected areas I told you about, the black lines on this map, are all co-managed between the government, the Forestry Conservation Institute, and local NGOs. So there is natural resource co-management in Tela. They already know and have a history of working with this. This is likely what led the fishers to start creating their own collaborative arrangements, of which I want to tell you specifically about two. Now the first is the Tela Bay Fisheries Management Plan. This management plan just basically establishes rules and regulations to protect the fishing resource. They range from gear restrictions up to special spatial zoning. You can see examples of this in the poster to your left. What's interesting about these restrictions is that they were all developed and approved by all parties in the Tela Bay, particularly the fishers. The other example is a little bit more complicated. It's in the Los Micos Lagoon. So Los Micos is a coastal lagoon in the Tela Bay, which seeds the reefs in the bay. And Los Micos was declared the first coastal preferential access rights system in Honduras. You're probably wondering what this is. This is basically territorial use rights for fishing with a Caribbean twist. It's similar to tourists in the fact that they give local fishing communities and fishers exclusive commercial harvest rights. They differ in the fact that fishers can come from outside the communities and harvest there, but they have to only follow a subsistence fishing quota, which is obviously much lower than what the local fishers get. So we're seeing that there's all these different and creative arrangements happening to ensure that fisheries in the area are sustainable. And none of this arrangement would be possible without community participation. You've heard this before, when the fishers first realized there was a problem, they were the ones who approached the decision makers. So they're there since step one. And you can see the pictures proving it, how they've been part of every single workshop and every single meeting. In fact, getting the fisheries plan approved took two years, much longer than any plan in Honduras. But the difference is that they were all in agreement with the regulations. They're so into community participation that currently, what they're doing is developing community surveillance committees to reduce poaching in the area. Now, when we surveyed the fishers and asked them about their participation, 72% said that they personally have a say in the management of the fishery. And 80% believe that the community is always taken into consideration in these arrangements. So we're really seeing that Tela is lucky to have these empowered communities which are willing to participate but also it has decision makers who are willing to share their rights and responsibilities. 
And that brings me to the next opportunity, bridging organizations. Let me tell you about the TELA Environmental Interinstitutional Committee. So this is an organization comprised by multiple sectors, academia, governments, local NGOs, and even international NGOs. And they all work together in the management of the resource. What they've done has been very important because they're able to improve communication between local actors, in our case the fishers, and national policymakers at a different level. And that's how we're getting all these collaborative arrangements to actually work. Now they've also been crucial for improving the local organizations and strengthening their work and creating financial opportunities, which have led to better enforcement and to monitoring efforts. So it has been very successful, but they haven't worked alone. About two years ago, the Tela Fishers Union was formed. This Fishers Union is just a platform where fishers from all across Tela come together, they share in their problems and they try to come up with solutions. These solutions are then presented to the Environmental Committee and they work together on implementing them. So we're seeing two distinct organizations working hand in hand to strengthen local institutions and to create more communication. Now, the final opportunity I wanna tell you about is cooperation, trust and leadership at a local level. Despite Tela being so diverse, people being so different culturally, they all tend to cooperate a lot together. If you look at the picture at the top right, this is a picture of fishers coming back from their harvest. The whole community comes out to greet them, including women and children, and they help them with the cleanup. In exchange, the fishers tend to give them part of their catch. So we're seeing that cooperation is part of their culture, no matter what culture it is. And we wanted to see if this cooperation and trust extended to the fishers association levels, are fishers working well together? What we saw is that, 92% of the fishers say they trust the leaders and members of their fishers association with their problems. This displays that there's a lot of trust among them. But what's more, 92% also said that specifically they trust their leaders to lead them in the right direction. An example of this is the picture you see below. That's the president of the fishers union and he's working with two female fishers in a fish fair. A fish fair is this initiative that they came up with all by themselves to improve their access to markets and to cut out the middlemen. So we're seeing that even though they're different, even though women sometimes weren't taking into consideration, they're slowly working up to this and cooperation is helping as well as good leadership. So let's recap what we've learned from La Tela Bay. First, what I see is that there are no perfect opportunities. Every time you try to shift to a new management system, such as co-management, you'll find challenges. In the case of TELA, it was the lack of formal agreements as well as reduced group cohesion. They were able to overcome this with collaborative arrangements, either informal or through alternative legal measures such as the Forestry Conservation Institute, and also through the strong cooperation and leadership among people. If we look at it at a wider approach and think about Caribbean fisheries in general, we've seen that some of the main issues is the top-down management, which is something that is no longer a problem if we're shifting to co-management, but also there's other problems such as weak institutions and lack of financial support. In TELA, they were able to overcome these issues through an empowered community working actively to improve their resources, but also through bridging organizations, which help strengthen all the local organizations and create more communication in the area, as well as financial opportunities. So, if I can just leave you with one message here today of all I've told you about is that if we really want sustainable fisheries and we want to create some buy-in in these alternative fisheries management efforts, like home management, we need to invest in social capital. What I mean is we need to strengthen these interpersonal relationships that way we can make sure that when new challenges come, and they will, they'll be able to overcome them. Thank you so much for your attention. If you have any questions, you can do them in the comment section, but also you can email me.